It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is The Bears, the Lions, and the Giants. Love these couple of chapters here we're going to look at today. And if you start in 1 Samuel 16 with verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. The people of Israel said, Everybody else in the world's got a king. We want a king. And God said, Okay, I'll give you a king. Gave him Saul. Saul turned out to be a piece of work. And at some point, clearly here, God says, I'm out. And in the Old Testament, unlike the New Testament, when you become a Christian in the New Testament, an extraordinary thing happens. The Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in your physical body, never to leave you or forsake you. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came on people but could go off. He'd go on, off, be on them, with them, um, but in you is something totally different. So yes, Saul was anointed king. The spirit of God was on him, but then God removed his spirit. And you don't, you know, as a Christian again, that can't happen to us. But back then, this was a horrific thing when it happened. So God tells Samuel, I'm done with Saul. Go to Bethlehem. Jesse the Bethlehemite. He's got eight boys. And uh, I've got... We're going to pick a king from among his sons. So he goes there. They're a little nervous because Samuel's a prophet. What are you doing here? Is this a good or a bad thing? Uh, if Saul finds out you're here, we're going to be in trouble. He sacrifices there. Then he tells Jesse, bring out all your sons. And so seven of them, as it turns out, are brought out. And he looks at one of them and goes, oh, certainly this is the oldest, the tall, you know, he's, he's got to be the guy. And God says, no, it's not him. Don't look on the outward appearance. We're not picking someone based on how they look. So he's not the guy. Uh, verse 9, go down there. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of, the son, of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. It's not, it's not one of the seven. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Is this all you got? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes, good looking, and the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So, David, so Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So it's important that his brother saw this happen. Samuel pours oil, which is this anointing, uh, symbolic of God uh, picking somebody, and uh, it's game on. Um, so let me go back to the Holy Spirit thing a minute. You say, well, Samuel anointed David king of Israel. That's a specific thing. Um, if you are a Christian, and I'm speaking primarily at the moment to Christians in the room and beyond, if you are a Christian, the, the same spirit that's being described here, again, has taken up residence in you. That should make a difference. You can't be a Christian without being picked. You say, well, I don't understand that. You don't have to understand everything to believe it. You can't be a Christian without being picked. So if God picked you and the Spirit of God lives in you, that means something. There is a purpose for your life. There is a reason why you are still alive. And you say, well, it's not like he picked me king. 
He, you are his child. You are a servant of the Most High God. That makes incredible, extraordinary, mind-bogglingly miraculous things possible. Because the same God who created and holds the universe together has chosen to live inside of you. Verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Like, what's going on? Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player of the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. So music's going to play a, a part in Saul's life. And it has to be someone skillful. Verse 18, then one of the servants answered and said, look, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Like, there's something about this kid. This should be, all these other things, it's great to have someone say this, but this should be an observable trait. The Lord is with you. Is that observable in my life, in your life? And as a Christian, the Lord is in you. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, a skin of wine, and a, and a young goat, and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David um, came to Saul, stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. So Saul ends up loving David, and this is very important, in the next chapter, became his armor bearer. So if Saul went to battle, he was the one, David's the one handling this armor. Then Saul sent to Jesse saying, please let David stand before me for he has found favor in my sight. And it was so, whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand, then Saul would become refreshed and well and the distressing spirit would depart from him. So, so literally this kid who has been anointed king over Israel, and if you add this up, I think it's 16 years since his anointing to when he actually becomes king, um, in this beginning of this process here, God is using the next king to minister to the current king without the current king even knowing what was going on. 1 Samuel 17. So the Philistines, or the Philistines, however you want to go with it, decided they were going to come up in battle at Succoth and uh, take on Israel. And I'm not going to read you every piece of this. We'll go down to verse 3. The Philistines stood on a mountain, one on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side in a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Now, if you go looking up six cubits in a span, a cubit is roughly from the tip of your finger to your elbow, about 18 inches, depending on how tall you are. And there's some translations that say, well, this is really... Um, not six cubits. So he, he could have been anywhere from like six foot six to nine foot six. He's a big guy. Back then, maybe people were like five and a half feet tall. So if a six foot nine guy, my dad was six foot nine at his height, and uh, it's big. You don't want to mess with six foot nine, I can assure you, especially when you're about two feet tall. It's very ominous. Um, so this giant of a man comes out, uh, and he's defying the armies of Israel. So let's read some of this. He comes out, um, he had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. So a huge piece of wood and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. So he is weighed down with all kind of armor, all this these, these weapons, and a shield bearer went before him. So he had some guy carrying his shield. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Forget the Saul killing with each other. You pick one, I'll be the guy. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants." 
But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Now, that was the deal. Remember this deal. Um, because if somebody did come out and kill David, kill Goliath, they had to all serve Israel. If somebody came out and Israel's guy was killed, then Israel had to serve them. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of the three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and uh, Shammah, David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So he's, he plays for him when he's a distressing spirit, and he's his armor bearer. But every once in a while, he goes back and checks on the sheep in Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So this is every day in the morning. Send me somebody, I'll fight you. The evening, send me somebody, no, no takers. Verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and, to, and it shall be the man who kills him. The king will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel, which I think has always been fascinating to me, that you get the wife, you get money, and you don't have to pay taxes. Um, then David spoke to the men who stood by, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered and said in this manner, saying, So shall it be to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard what he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? Now, what does Eliab know? That Samuel showed up in their hometown and poured oil on his, little, his baby brother's head and something's up. So what are you doing here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Like this must be an ongoing feud between the brothers. Is there not a cause? There's a reason to be here. Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as at the first, uh, as the first ones did. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistines. So who is this punk kid showing up saying, I'll take him. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him for you are a youth and a man of war, and he a man of war from his youth. You're just a kid. Do not let anyone tell you you're just a kid. But David said to Saul, your servant, now, now look at this. And I had a conversation with a young man recently about this passage and about what I'm about to share out of these next few verses. And the... If we'll see in a second, he takes on Goliath and he kills him. And the question was, was this a miracle? Was David's killing Goliath a miracle? And I say the answer is no. Now read the rest of this with me. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. You say, well, how does he have this courage? If you haven't been fighting the lions and the bears, you'll never take on the giants. Now you say, well, there's got to be a miracle here somewhere. Certainly God has protected David. He wasn't killed by the lions and the bears. This kid's got some game. He showed up like, who is this giant? I don't care how big he is. He's defying my God. 
Now you say, well, was it all just bowed up in pride and arrogance? No, the kid had game. So if you fought lions and bears and a giant shows up, you're not just saying, well, what am I going to do? You know what you're going to do. You're going to take them on. Now you say, well, if I had a chance to fight the giants, I'd fight the giants. If you can't fight the little battles, you will never take on the big battles. And when the giants of your life show up, you're not, you're, you won't even think about taking them on. Keep reading. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. Uncircumcised Philistine would be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Now you say, well, but then that God delivering him from the hand of the Philistine. Just stay with me. So Saul clothed David with his armor. Put, Saul put his own armor on David. And he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword, in other words, Saul's sword, to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested him. Like, let me see how this feels. And David said to Saul, I can't walk in these, for I've not tested them. Like, I don't know how to fight in your stuff. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, so he's got a stick in one hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So what does David go with? What he knows. Stop trying to fight someone else's battles or your battles someone else's way. Verse 41, so the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? What do you think, I'm a dog? That you come to me with sticks? You and your little staff? You're going to come here and fight me with a stick? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He said, Well, how was he able to say that? You got to know your God. And stop focusing on what you can do by yourself. We talked about this recently. Backup. David had backup. I'll tell you who his backup was. God himself. But God sends us into battle. That's just how it works. And you say, well, what if it doesn't go well? It's going to go well. You've got to show up at the battle. And this giant had defied the armies of the Lord. And again, if I can get this out, I'm going to read again. You come to me with a sword, spear, and a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. I'm about to take your head off, big boy. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So what's at stake here? At part of what he's claiming is you say you're going to take me, guess what? I'm going to take you, the God of the universe is behind me, and everybody when I get done with you is not going to know, they'll, they'll think I'm great maybe, but they're going to know that there is a God in Israel, and he can bring it. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now, again, I'm telling you, if, if, you're, if you're scared, you're not going to make it this far. 
And you say, well, I'm scared. Here's how you get over being scared when you're facing giants. You practice with lions and bears. Okay? You've got to be working the lions and the bears. You'll be ready for the giant. And you won't even know, you won't even think about not being ready. You'll be so ready. Keep reading. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling, a sling, and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, <laughs> and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. He killed Goliath with Goliath's sword, beheaded him. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley of the gates of Ekron. By the way, all it takes is one kid to inspire a whole army. So you think, well, it's just me. It's never just you. God is at work in you and through you. And sometimes when we do what we are supposed to do, someone else does what they're supposed to do. And they go, okay, if he can do it, I can do it. I, I'm not getting left out of this. Uh, verse 53, then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem and he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. I mean, don't let your kids read this, obviously, but um, it's, people say, oh, here's a Bible. You need to read the Bible. You don't need to do that to an eight-year-old. Like, ah, what happened? And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now, I don't have a physical giant in my life. For a while I did, kind of. My dad could, it could get wacky. Um, but I can tell you that there are giants out there that want a piece of you and of us. And I need to and you need to fight the bears and the lions and get you some wins so that when the big time comes, you can stand and having done all to stand. But none of this works without one person. And his sweet name is Jesus. And on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And in his humanity, he fought in a garden against a real enemy and three times asked his dad, is there any way this cup can pass from me? But if not, not my will, your will be done. And he took on the giant. And it turns out the giant wasn't the devil. It was me and my sin. And he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you've already won and you just don't know it if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, you don't have to live this way anymore with fear and guilt and shame. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for young men like David. And even though he had his challenges, you said that he was a man after your own heart. Father, you have left us here to fight. 
You have left us here to be encouragement to other people, to challenge other people, and some of it is with the way we live and the way we stand and our unwillingness to yield and our ability to be able to declare that you are the Lord of hosts, the armies of God, and that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. But for anybody who does not know you personally, and it's all just been a bunch of religious stuff, or maybe they've never even heard of it, maybe today is their day, and they understand that you love them, and something's going on they can't explain, and they now understand that Jesus died on a cross and was buried and raised from the dead, shed his blood to pay for them, for their sin, for their past, their future, their everything. And that they can be born, as it were, a second time, like starting all over. And be forgiven and have a second chance, not without challenges or difficulties, but just not alone anymore. So may someone in this room or beyond, Lord, just pray a simple prayer. God, I, I know I've screwed up. I'm a sinner, and I can't fix it. But I believe that Jesus can, that he died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead to pay for my sin, to purchase me eternal life as a free gift. I accept you, all of it, package deal, free gift, and all I have to say is thank you for loving me, for saving me, for rescuing me. And now I pray that you would teach me how to have a relationship with you and walk with you and listen to you and obey you and trust you and not go back to living a full life that never worked before. Why would it ever work again? Help me stay close to you and stop fighting you ultimately just to yield and serve and see what you have, which I know will be best. And again, Lord, for the believers here and beyond, um, help us fight, Lord. Help us figure it out who we are in you, not try to be somebody else, just to be who you made us to be and live it out and love it out and lead people to you just by who you are in and through us, Lord. Help us get out of the way, stay out of the way, and see what you can do and see the giants fall along the way. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.